Good afternoon, everybody. It is my pleasure to welcome you to an APSAC Zoom chat. My name is Dr. Janet Rosenzweig. I have the privilege of serving as the Executive Director of the American Professional Society on the Abuse of Children, and we are delighted to be offering you this series of Zoom chats designed to bring you current information and resources to help you serve your communities and the families in your caseloads as we all learn to navigate this new world that the pandemic has brought us all to live in. Uh, we typically start the Zoom chat with a little bit of a Washington update, then we move into a excellent presentation, and we'll follow that up by taking your questions and answers. Um, let me, for those of you who don't know about us, APSAC is the American Professional Society on the Abuse of Children, the only national multidisciplinary membership society dedicated to the professionals from every profession that work in any way around child maltreatment. We've got close to 1,500 members from multiple, multiple professions. We publish the journal Child Maltreatment. We publish um, the peer-reviewed newsletter, the APSAC Advisor, and the newsletter, the APSAC Alert, designed to bring you current, up-to-date information for your practice, and we specialize in custom training. Um, today, we'd like to start this webinar, again, with a couple of national things we thought you might want to know. Uh, the first thing to know is that a uh, Senator Bob Casey and Representative Rob Schreier have just introduced emergency funding for the Child Protection Act. It's legislation for extra CAPTA funds to help meet the most urgent needs. Uh, when I'm done talking, and uh, I will put the link to read the bill into the chat box, we encourage you to read the bill and to please contact your federal representatives and urge them to support this bill. The other federal news we just learned today is that the Small Business Administration appears to have cut off accepting new applications for the Payroll Protection Plan. So for those of you who submitted an application to the Payroll Protection Plan, uh, depending on where you are in the process, um, you may once again have been shut out like folks were from the first round that was supposed to stay open till June and closed after about 10 days. It appears as if the second round of PPP loans uh, was closed by the SBA today. Uh, not great news for those of us that might have been in that queue. Uh, the other piece of news we'd like to share that's not legislative in nature, but it's you know around legal issues, the National District Attorneys Association just published an article on conducting and defending um, during a, a pandemic era forensic interview. Uh, uh, Bree Stormer, Bree, wave your hand so people can see you. One of our magicians behind the screen at APSAC, our manager of publications and special programs. Bree is going to put that link out for you to see, uh, co-authored by APSAC board member Victor Veith, the name that's familiar to many people. Uh, but we wanted to make you aware of that resource and urge you to use it and share it. Um, also with us today is APSAC president, Dr. Dave Corwin. Dave, if you'd like to say uh, hello to folks, it would be great. I don't, Dave, I'm, you're, you're okay. Am I muted? Uh, I'm no. unmuted by the host now. Can you hear me? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Susan, for joining us today and providing the presentation for this web chat. I'd like to thank everybody who's uh, attending online. There's over uh, 250 of you so far. Um, so it's our pleasure to do this. I would rather be in Hawaii, but I feel quite <laughs> safe in my home. And uh, it's a beautiful, warm, sunny day here in Salt Lake City today. So I hope it's nice where all of you are as well. And stay safe. Uh, practice your social distance. Uh -oh. Dave, I think we lost your audio. So I will take it back. Uh, before I introduce Susan and we get to heart of today's um, get to the heart of today's Zoom chat, uh, watch APSAC's website. We have 
several more coming up. Um, ask the Child Psychiatrist. Uh, we'll be presenting Dr. Roslyn Murov as a help giving us creative ideas from what she's learned on helping families deal with stress during uh, the during the pandemic. Next week we'll be presenting. Um, help Bree, help me with next week's topic. We have two. Um, ah, that. Correct. We've got, uh, I, I'm pulling up the page right now. Uh, the title uh, roughly is Guidance for Teachers and Counselors During the COVID-19 Crisis. Um, and we also have uh, one of our uh, webinars with um, the New York Foundling on TFCBT for children in foster care. Um, I'm pulling up... Um, our COVID-19 resource page, which is always updated with upcoming Zoom chats as well as videos for past Zoom chats. Um, and I'll share the webinar page as well. Great, and next week's chat with Dr. Page is gonna be an exciting opportunity to participate in the development of an instrument that they're working on to help people identify risk while working with kids remotely. So that's exciting, exciting stuff coming next week. We encourage you to do that. Um, if you are a member of APSAC, we thank you so much for being part of our club. If you are not a member of APSAC, we really, really urge you to join. Um, if you join, you can use the discount code ZoomChat10 and get 10% off your membership. Um, this is a great time to join because uh, you get your membership counts from the day you join, but you get a full year starting July 1. So if you join now, you get a couple extra months thrown in. So we very much want to encourage you to join APSAC. Um, a little bit about the logistics. Uh, after I introduce Susan, we're going to mute everybody except Susan. And we're ask folks while Susan is presenting if you would turn your cameras off. And when she's done in about a half an hour, we're all going to unmute, turn our cameras back on, and do a Q&A session. So um, if, if you would do that with us, that would be great. If you have questions, you can put them in the chat box. I'll be collecting those questions as well as the ones that were submitted before and be presenting them to Susan. And of course, we'll be happy to take individual questions from you as well. So without further ado, I'm delighted to introduce Susan Kennedy, the Prevention Program Manager at the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, which is doing some fabulous work around keeping kids safe online. When they share the number of cases that have come to their attention, the number is so large as to be mind-blowing. So we'll, we'll let Susan do that. Uh, prior to coming to NICMIC, Susan was the director of the Child Advocacy Center, serving Alexander, Alexandria, Virginia's children. So for our CA folks, CAC folks out there, we've got one of your own with us today. She's got a bachelor's from the College of William and Mary and a master's in education from Harvard. So Susan, without further ado, thank you so much for joining us. Hey, um, thank you. Thank you so much for having me um, and hosting the stream chat about online safety, which I know is top of mind for many of us working with kids and worrying about kids in these times. Um, I do. Um, and thank you for that introduction, Janet. I was a CAC director and a forensic interviewer. And so I, I know there are many more of you out there today on the call. Um, um, but I also did a lot of work around um, prevention when I was at the CAC and beforehand. So um, I'm thrilled to be able to focus full-time on prevention and talk with you about that um, part of our work today. I do want to say at the front that, um, you know, we're talking about online safety, but um, as we talk about online safety today, we are going to be talking about child sexual abuse. We're going to be talking about child exploitation. And I know for probably um, all, all the time as professionals, um, but that may, may not be true of everyone. So I just want to kind of give that warning that that is the topic area we're going to be going into here. And I also think, and I want to reiterate that, you know, obviously right now, um, things may be hitting us differently or affecting us differently. We're at home. Um, we're all just in a different headspace. So um, I just want to invite everyone, you know, to be gentle and careful with yourself. If this is, as we're going through, you know, if you're finding that this isn't what you want to be focusing on and hearing about today, that's fine. It's recorded. You can leave, take care of yourself. Um, and also, I just want to say, I hope everyone who does work in the space of child maltreatment is fully aware and taking advantage of resources around vicarious trauma and compassion fatigue. 
And if you are not connected to those resources, um, certainly let AppSec know. I'm sure um, you know, they can connect you to great resources and I'm happy as well. So I just wanna give that kind of statement out front um, so we all kind of know what we're delving into here. Um, if AppSec magicians, if you could go to my next slide, please. Um, if you're not familiar at all with the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, um, what I just want to share with you briefly is our mission, which is to find missing children, reduce sexual um, exploit, child sexual exploitation, and prevent future victimization. If you work in this space um, around missing children, which I want to be very clear is mostly children who have run away from home. Um, if you work with kids who have been sexually abused and sexually exploited, um, and you have not heard of the National Center, I'm not going to talk at all about the resources we have for families and for professionals. So if you're not familiar, I know um, AppSec Magicians just put our website in the chat box. I would invite you to look around and definitely reach out to me after if you have any questions about what we do or you want more information. Um, we'll go on to the next slide, which is about our cyber tip line. And Janet sort of talked a minute ago about the astounding amount of um, material and referrals and reports we get into the cyber tip line every year. Um, it is in over in the tens of millions, um, over 10 million every year. Um, and so I just want to set the stage a little bit that what we're talking about in terms of an exploited child, you can see the list there on the slide. This service is a service um, that we are mandated to do by Congress. And so we sort of act as a clearinghouse and in getting information every day from internet service providers, from the public, from law enforcement about reports of child sexual exploitation on the internet. And so what I want to say about this today as we're talking about prevention is that we use this data um, very closely with our prevention program. So we use what we're seeing every day happening to kids online. And our goal really is to turn that information into usable resources and messages that you all can take to your local communities and really inform um, you know, the professionals who are in the lives of children about what we're seeing and what's happening to kids online. Again, if you work in child exploitation or child abuse at all, and you are not aware of the cyber tip line, please go and explore it um, and let me know if you want more information. Um, I want to make sure everyone knows about cyber tip line. We'll talk a little bit more about reporting um, and getting content down off the internet a little later in the presentation. Um, but if you'll move to our next slide, um, before we get into online safety, I want to set the stage and be very clear and kind of make this connection to say that when we're talking about child exploitation on the internet, we are talking about child sexual abuse. We're talking about child sexual abuse that's facilitated by technology or facilitated by the internet. So when we sit down to think about what we need to do to keep children safe from child sexual exploitation, what we need to tell families so that they are equipped to keep kids safe online, it is not a separate thing that we're doing from helping kids stay safe from child sexual abuse. In fact, those two things can and should be very closely connected. They're really the same thing. And indeed, um, you know, we could spend an hour and a half on, on this topic, um, just, just talking about the interplay and the connections. Um, um, here, but um, we know that most of the offenders who harm children when technology in you, at, is used are people that they know in real life. The dynamics are not that different from child sexual abuse, and we tend to treat them as two different issues. And as we're moving through the presentation and as you're thinking about how you work with families, one of the main takeaways I want to give to everyone here is that we need to be careful not to draw too stark of a distinction between online and real life. These things are mixed together. The dynamics are similar. The players are the same. A lot of times a case that's happening online has victimization and relationships that are offline. And that's really, really important for us to understand and to convey through our messages to parents. Um, and I think too, you know, when we talk about this kind of this age and, and, and the life we're all living right now, um, you know, there may be an opportunity here for, you know, us adults to really understand that and understand the connections between real and online life and social life online and social life um, in real life, because a lot of us have shifted in ways we didn't before to using technology, obviously, to stay connected with friends and family. So there may be opportunities here for some really interesting conversations um, between kids and adults and teenagers and adults as we're all kind of learning how to integrate and balance um, those two things. So I wanna put that in the forefront of people's brains as we move along um, to the next slide, which um, is really kind of, you know, I'm gonna outline and Again, I, as I was moving through here, I thought of like four things that we could probably spend an hour talking about, but I'm going to try and keep us moving to the half an hour clip um, for sure. So this is what I've come up with in terms of um, how I want to focus our time. You know, first talk a little bit about what we're seeing and what we're concerned about. And again, hopefully bringing to this audience a little bit of that perspective of the National Center with our national 
view of child exploitation. What are we worried about? What are we seeing during this time? And then take that and figure out and talk a little bit about what our key messages to parents and kids about online safety is right now, right here in this time. Um, I do want to run through some NCMEC safety resources, and I also want to talk a little bit on the flip side, um, how can we prepare and how can we start thinking about what we can do to help kids um, who have been already victims of online exploitation and make sure that you all are aware of some of those resources. Um, so as we move to the next slide, which really again is, um, you know, so what are we seeing? What's going on? What are we concerned about? All of us probably have 10 other things we could be doing with this half hour and we're choosing to spend it here talking about online safety. And we're worried because kids are home. They're not in school. They're not in activities. They are home and a lot of them are using screens um, much more and they're using them for school. But, you know, to be honest, they're also using them um, because parents are doing other things. Parents are trying to work from home. Parents are quarantining separately. Parents are at work. Um, and kids don't have access to daycares and schools. This is obvious, we know that, that's why we're all here, right? Um, technology does afford access and opportunity. So it connects people and it connects good people together. It connects people who have bad intentions with children. That's just a fact of technology. So we're worried about access and opportunity. We're worried about the fact that coupled with that access and, and opportunity, we have less supervision and less monitoring. It is just a reality that parents are stretched thin right now, they've got um, you know, concerns, they've got family members to look after, they have work, they're not supervising and monitoring their kids as much as perhaps they were before. And there are teachers to monitor them and daycare providers um, and all of that. So we know those two things. The other thing um, that I think goes along with this that we're worried about is, is there's a sense, and you can read some media reports and law enforcement kind of talking about how this time may also lead to an increase in demand. So what I mean by that is there are also people who are not working and who are home and who are interested in seeing explicit content of children. And there is a higher demand to find that content, a higher demand perhaps for new content. And let's be very clear about what I mean by new content. New content is new images and videos of children being sexually abused. And so when we're thinking about what does higher demand mean, it may mean more circulation of existing images. It could also mean more demand for people who have access to children to sexually abuse them, record that abuse, and put it online and share it with other people. And so again, I go back to kind of what I said before. So then let's put our prevention hats on. How do we stop that from happening? We need to stop child sexual abuse. We need to do everything that we normally do to stop child sexual abuse. And that's what I mean about the interplay of real world and online um, is, is that imagery that circulated online is evidence and documentation of a hands-on offense. And so um, we're thinking about that as well. So we've got increased opportunity, less supervision, more demand, obviously um, a kind of scary, perfect storm. Now, I also wanna talk about um, the fact that relationships, as I talked about before, relationships of all kinds are shifting online and we are all experiencing this. That means peer relationships are going online. So the extent there was harassment and bullying going on at school, that harassment and bullying was probably also going on online, but now it's shifting because there's no, um, there's no real world contact right now, right? So all of that's going online. Um, and then I wanna talk about this self-produced content. What I'm talking about there, if you're not familiar, I'm talking about sexting. So sending explicit messages to each other, sending especially nude or partially nude pictures to one another, sending nudes to a boyfriend, sending nudes to a girlfriend. Um, that was already happening and we know that. Um, again, this is another area where we could go off for two hours and talk about sexting and talk about, you know, sending explicit imageries and, and what we think, um, you know, the appropriateness and the right messaging and the right interventions and the right prevention. Um, but I think, you know, the inarguable part of that is it's still happening and it's probably happening more. You know, you can envision kids who never would have asked their girlfriend for a nude might be asking now, right? Everyone's quarantined separately, we get this. Um, you've got people who probably would never have sent a topless photo or a nude photo to their boyfriend who are considering it now or doing it now. People who never would have engaged in sexual activity over a video chat or over a FaceTime or over you know, a video chat and some other app may be considering doing that now. So I think it's fair to say um, it's, it's very likely there's more self-produced content out there. And again, we could go back and forth about, you know, what's the risk of that behavior? Um, and, 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 you know, again, what is the appropriateness and, and what should we be saying about that? But I think we can also agree that the risk when you send an explicit image to someone else, that that content will be shared, um, that there will be harassment or shaming about that image, that there might be, I have on the slide here, sextortion. If you're not familiar with that term means, it means um, it's a combination of the word sex and extortion. So, so coercing some, someone 
to do something like produce more imagery, like meat for sexual content. Um, it could be money, it could be other things, but forcing them to do something because you have sexual content. And oftentimes it's, it's coursing them for more content. So you sent me this one image, if you don't send me another one or a different kind of nude image, I'm gonna spread this around to all of your friends or I'm gonna share this in the whole school or things like that. Um, so I think we can infer that if there's more content floating around, there's more of a concern for sex extortion and harassment and shaming and, and those kinds of things happening as a result of that. So that's a, a third thing we're kind of worried about in this time. And then the fourth thing I just wanna share with you all as we've been talking internally at NCMEC about um, what we're seeing in this era, right? One of the interesting things that my colleagues in the child sex trafficking team shared with us is that they're starting to see that sex traffickers are noticing that there is more, um, that there's a reluctance for buyers of commercial sex from children to meet in person to uh, do that, to exploit children and assault them, right? And so one thing that some traffickers are doing is they're starting to charge subscription fees to websites that provide images and videos of um, their victims. So that's a way that now we had victimization that was previously occurring in person, now maybe shifting or some of it may be going online and there is perhaps content created, um, obviously that is victimizing to a child that is now online. So those are all the things that we're worried about and why we're all here today and what we're gonna talk about. Um, and again, there'll be questions and answers at the end. So feel free to pop those in the chat box as we're moving through. Um, but I do wanna take a deep breath and let's move forward to prevention and what we're gonna talk to kids and families about all that stuff. So the next slide talks about um, how important it is. Okay, so I wanna, I wanna explain why I have this slide in here. So this slide is actually lifted right from our parent presentation um, with NetSmarts um, when we talk about technology and internet safety. And I like this slide so much, I put it in the presentation twice, <laughs> um, which everyone thought was a mistake, but it was not. Um, I, I think when we talk to parents about internet safety, we, um, we really need to take a deep breath. We know kids are gonna be online more and that's okay because protecting kids online was never about being constantly over their shoulder, reading every post, reading every text message. Um, one of my, my favorite internet safety presenters, um, who I know many of you know in the ICAC world, Joe Laramie talks about, you know, you, you're not gonna read every text message your child sends. No one has that kind of time, right? No one's doing that. So take a deep breath, you're not doing it now, it's okay. Um, but what we do wanna communicate to parents is internet safety and safety from exploitation. Again, setting expectations, monitoring, but really most importantly, it's the relationship and the connections. Having a relationship with your kid that's built on mutual trust, where they are getting guidance from you about safe decisions, um, about how to fix mistakes, how to handle a search situation they're not sure about, and coming to you with questions. And this should sound very familiar to those of us who work in the child sexual abuse prevention space, right? What do we tell parents? We tell them one of the most important things you can do to protect your kid from child sexual abuse is to have a really good relationship where you're communicating about sex and relationships and safety and boundaries and consent and all of that. It is the same for internet safety. What we need to do is we need to work and be better about combining these things and saying we need to be talking to our kids about their bodies, about sex, about private parts, and we need to put online into that conversation. So we're talking to our young kids about private parts are private. We don't show them in public. We don't walk outside. We don't show our private parts to people. That includes on video chats. That includes on social media. That includes when you're um, FaceTiming or you're posting somewhere. You also don't show your private parts there. And Adults shouldn't be showing you their private parts, and that includes through technology. They shouldn't be sending those parts of their bodies to you. They shouldn't be showing them to you, real life or technology. Put all that stuff together. Build that kind of relationship. You're talking to your adolescents about healthy sexuality and making decisions in romantic partnerships, consent, empathy, boundaries, online and real life. Put these things together. Talk about them together. That kind of relationship is what's so important. Um, so again, this is kind of good news. No one needs to go back to school and get a computer networking degree. Um, you don't have to spend hours learning ins and outs and ups and downs and pros and cons of every single app. Um, and again, you don't have to sit around reading all your kids' um, posts and chat messages. The bad news is the rest of this presentation is not going to be a list of the bad apps that you can just delete off all of your kids' phones and you'll be fine. I'm not gonna do that. I'm not gonna go through that list. Um, and I'm also not going to share with you, you know, this a magical monitoring software or set of controls you can put on your kids' devices and then not worry about any of this. That stuff is good. We will talk a little bit about that stuff. Those are good things to do. But the message to parents really needs to be, 
I don't care what kind of parental controls and monitoring and good, bad apps you have, none of that replaces relationship, communication, ongoing communication and trust, monitoring, supervision. Those, that communication and that relationship is really the most important part of internet safety and no combination of technology controls replaces that. Um, so as we move to the next slide, um, I am gonna go through what we did in the beginning of this pandemic is we looked at one of our um, internet safety tip sheets that we use all the time. It's called Protecting Children Online. Um, I think Bree is gonna put in the box um, a link to this information on a website. At the bottom, you can print off this tip sheet. It's available in English and Spanish if you wanna share it with any of your families or in your networks. Um, but we looked at those and we picked out the top six tips. And we're gonna talk for a little bit about adaptations you can make um, in this COVID environment for how these, how these tips would look different now. So I'm gonna run through these very quickly. Setting some ground rules. And you can read what the ground, what that rule is on the slide, right? So just because right now your rule in, in the old world where we weren't all sheltered in place might have been 30 minutes of TV, of screen time a day, or might have been an hour or two hours. It might be four hours now. <laughs> um, it might be, you know, they, maybe they were just on educational games um, and now they're allowed to play whatever they want on the Xbox for three hours a day, whatever it is. Just because the rules are different doesn't mean there shouldn't be rules. So telling parents, just because the rules are much more expansive now, kids still need ground rules. When can they use their apps? When can they use their devices? Um, what part of the house? You know, one thing we really recommend at NCMEC is not to have especially young kids um, behind closed doors with um, connected devices. So you might have rules for where in the house kids can use their devices, especially the younger kids, um, what kinds of apps they can use, and where, where they can use them, when they can use them. There should be rules, even if the rules are very different now. And then tip number two is really what I just talked about. Um, which is you cannot just, you know, tell yourself my kid doesn't have social media, my kid doesn't have these five apps that I found, you know, online that are dangerous for kids, so I just don't have to worry about my kid online. That's just not true. Um, you do still have to talk with your kids about what they're doing. And again, on the one hand, you feel like I should have more time to talk to my kid. And then on the other hand, you know, we know how these days go and you get to the end of the day and, and you've just been crazy all day and you didn't have a lot of quality time. So what we're talking to parents about um, is, you know, in terms of monitoring and having active conversation, like one tip is, you know, maybe you used to sit right with your young child and look at YouTube together, and God bless you for walk watching all of those um, unboxing videos and whatever else little kids watch on YouTube, right? Um, you can't sit right with them and watch it because you have to do a webinar about online safety. So, but maybe what you do do is you have your child in the same room with you using headphones, and you can see visually, okay, they're still on the PBS Kids app, they're still on the YouTube kids, or I gave them permission to watch something, they don't have my permission to be posting right now, or they don't have my permission to be chatting right now, and I can see visually what they're doing, even if we're doing different things. So tips like that that help parents make this monitoring really doable in this day and age um, is important. Um, and then this number three, knowing the platforms. I said in the beginning, you don't have to have an engineering degree and know the ins and outs and ups and downs of everything, but you do need to be familiar with what your kids are doing online. And we always say the best way to do that is to ask your kids to show you. How do they use these apps? What is so cool about them? How can people contact you? How can we control who's contacting you? How would you block someone who made you uncomfortable? How would you report something? Um, walk me through your thought process and setting up the profile that the way you did or, the, or let's do that together. Um, have your kids show you, because again, we could talk about the good and bad apps. If they're not the ones your kid used, that does, that's not a good use of your time know the platforms and the things that your kids are using and ask them to show you how they work and look at them together and, and ask questions. I mean, definitely ask questions about what are the parental controls that are available here. Did we set up your profile so that the platform knows that you're a child? Because um, there are different settings and controls. And look at that. Um, those are all really important things to do, but do them with your child. Um, and then number four, which is also on here, this talk about it. Again, you know, I go back and forth. Yes, we should have more time with our kids, but some, of, some days it doesn't feel like that. Some days we feel like we have very little time and we're not spending, I would argue a lot of parents are not spending the time their kids are connected with their kids. They're using that time to work. They're using that time for household duties. They're using that time to check in with family members. So if you're not gonna do it at the same time, talk about it before and after. I'm gonna go upstairs and work for several hours. I have, I have this amazing webinar upstairs to go listen to. Um, so I'm gonna be upstairs, what are you doing online? Okay, if you're playing a game, are some of your friends coming too? Who are those friends and how are they doing? Um, 
you know, if they're going to be on platforms, they're chatting, what are you posting about today? Um, who, who else, who's been interacting with you and what are they up to? And then checking at the end of the day, how was your day? What did you do online today? Um, you know, did anything bother you online? You know, any, anything that you saw your friends posting or someone else posting like bug you or bother you? Was there anything uncomfortable that happened? Um, you know, any videos that you found by accident you didn't mean to find and, um, you know, or you did and you thought it'd be cool, but it's actually, it was a little scary or it was a little uncomfortable or whatever. Just invite those conversations. Again, the way we would if our kids were going somewhere physically, they're doing stuff online. Talk with them about it, what they're planning to do, what they did, how it went and invite those conversations as well. And even if it's short these days, even if it's a short check-in, um, you know, that's, that's important. Last two tips, um, this get involved is also really important. Um, we want to create relationships where kids don't feel like I live my own life here and my parents are in my real life here and those things are completely separate. We want kids to feel like as adults, we understand and we're involved in their online life. Again, not that we're over their shoulder and in it every day, but that we are involved and we get it and we respect it. Um, so right now, you may not be able to sit down and play a game with your kid for an hour or sit and watch TikTok videos for 45 minutes straight because there's just too much going on. But you could take like a 15 minute break maybe and go play around or watch a couple videos with them. You know, what, what are you doing online? What's so cool about that? What's the, neat, what's, the, what's the funniest thing you've seen today? Let's watch it together. I think too, um, you know, we're all up here. I, I can't see your screens. Many of you are probably multitasking right now. You know, you can, if you and your kid both have Instagram, sign on Instagram and send them a message through that platform of something funny or something interesting that you see on there. Again, that gives kids the sim signal, oh yeah, my parents are also in this world, you know, and they're not seeing everything I'm doing. I'm not naive, I realize that. But you're, you're, you're stepping in, you're popping in, you're saying hi, you're being in that world a little bit. You know, send them a text message. You know, how's it going down there? What are your friends up to? What are you guys talking about? How, how's, how's down there? This webinar, like I said, amazing webinar, very funny presenter, great information. I'm having an excellent time upstairs. How are things going with you online? And what are you guys up to? And use technology sometimes to connect so that it's clear you're coming into that world and that you're there. And they can say, actually, you know, my friends are talking about this stuff or, you know, two of my friends are really, you know, going after each other. It's making me comfortable in this text chain. Maybe we could talk about that later. I'm not sure how to handle it. You want kids to know that you are a resource to help them navigate this stuff because it's hard stuff. Um, and then lastly, which I think is a really important tip all the time, but especially in this time, we always encourage parents to not sort of, not just take technology away when there's a problem. So when a kid has made a mistake, when a child is not following your expectations, to, to not have, you know, that first instinct maybe to just take the computer and take the phone away. And a lot of times that's, that's not a helpful response. Like I said, this stuff is tough. It's hard. And kids need guidance and they need your help. And so if you just take the device away, you're not helping them figure out how to fix mistakes, navigate difficult situations, report things that have happened that made them uncomfortable. Even if they had a role... Um, in what happened, we want them to work through that and problem solve and, and develop critical thinking and decision skills and taking the technology away doesn't help them do that. Um, and I know many people on this call right now are also thinking of kids who are in homes that are not safe um, and have parents and have family members that aren't able to be supportive and, and aren't and are you know, toxic and dangerous. And so technology right now is a literal lifeline for many kids, you know, either to reach trusted adults they know through school or mentors or extended family, or to talk to helplines, chat lines, reporting lines. We want kid, those kids especially to have access to their technology. So giving parents the message that taking away technology, especially now, when it's not like you could take their phone and at least they're going to see their friends tomorrow in school. That's not true. This is the only way they're connected to the outside world. And for any kid, for any human, that's really important. Um, so encouraging parents not to take them away, but also working with parents because, gosh, you also can't ground them right now. You can't tell them they can't go to the football game next weekend. Um, so thinking through maybe incremental loss of access, you know, shortening the times they're able to use it, shortening the places, you know, maybe taking away access to certain kinds of apps or monitoring more or, you know, some kind of consequence um, that is logical and meaningful, but is stopping short of totally taking away access to technology is really important. Um, AppSat, can you guys give me I, how much time I have left? The sense? Uh, um, can you hear me? Yes. 
you've got about 20 minutes and you can go up to 20 minutes. Up to 20 minutes more? Yes. Amazing. Okay. okay. Um, so we, we do have about nine questions, so I do want to keep the okay. question time at the end. Yeah, yeah. I'll try to stick to 10 or 15, but that's great to know. Um, okay, so moving on to the next slide, what I want to do next is just make sure you guys are aware of some of the resources that we have that are ready to go, locked and loaded for you to use in your local communities as you want. Our program, NetSmarts, is an internet safety program that's getting ready to celebrate 20 years. So it is um, a program we've had for a long time, missingkids.org slash NetSmarts, I think it's coming over to you now. Um, so poke around there. If you go to the next slide, it'll have kind of a list of some of our um, resources that we have um, available. Um, presentations, I mentioned the PowerPoint presentation for adults. Those are scripted and ready to go. You can present them over Zoom. Um, so those may be helpful. There's some for adults and elementary, middle school, and high school students as well. Um, tip sheets, lots of tip sheets that you can print and distribute if you still have a way where you're seeing kids, um, maybe for food distributions or other ways you're providing in-person services. They can also be shared online um, and distributed um, online as well. Um, videos, games. I also want to say there's a course called Teaching Online Safety that we have. Um, where you can go and have a longer discussion about the types of victimization and really get more familiar with that stuff and how to talk about it with kids of various ages um, and how to bring up these issues with parents and kids that you work with as well. That's available for free online. I would also lastly encourage you to follow us on social media. We're putting out, um, as Janet said, um, and I know AppSec has been amazing putting out new content in this area um, and it's time for us right now. And we've also tried to have a lot of adapted content. So those stuff are, those um, things on social media are informative, but they're also things that you are welcome to share right on your networks as well with your kids and families if that's a way that you are able to reach them during this time. So definitely check that out as well. Um, and then the next slide, um, this is a great resource too that a lot of people aren't aware of. Um, NetSmartsKids.org is a kids safe website that um, does not jump off back to our website or YouTube or anywhere else. Kids can be on the site and watch the videos. They're downloadable activities. Again, if you are in a position where you're having in-person in contact somehow, these are things that can be printed out. Um, and kids can do, you can, I put my favorite activity about trusted adults on there. Um, so these are things that you can use in your communities as well. Um, we have an interactive game that kids can play. And the nice thing about the game is it reinforces what's going on in the videos about internet safety. And you actually have to watch the videos to get information to play the next level of the game. So it's a way to keep kids engaged, especially now when they're choosing their own entertainment, um, to give them something that's really fun to do that's also teaching them important information about online um, safety and online privacy and, and things like that. Um, the next slide, that um, is just a little bit more information about our newest series. This came out just, um, the full season was out early 2020. So if you haven't been to NetSmarts in a while, you may not have seen the redo of our um, programs for elementary school age kids in particular, really to help parents talk about these issues with kids who are younger. Um, and it may be hard to talk about some of these issues, but also to hopefully set kids and families up in positive behaviors with this interaction and talking about online safety from the beginning. So Into the Cloud has interactive episodes that kids can watch. And if you'll go to the next, yeah, the next slide um, has these discussion guides, which are available in English and Spanish and can be printed and given to parents. It really walks them through. You just watched this episode about online, online privacy. Kids, let's open your apps. Let's look at what you have and let's look at your privacy settings and decide if there are changes we want to make now that we just learned more about this issue in the episode. And it, and it has role playing. How would you talk to someone who'd experienced cyberbullying? How would you explain to someone um, about why they shouldn't put all of their personal information on the internet? So really skill building activities around online safety. And, you know, these could even be done, you know, over a Zoom or over a FaceTime call, or again, distributed to parents either online um, or they can be printed. Um, okay. So that's all the online safety. There's a ton more and I know you got the link. Um, so explore those. Let me know if you have questions about those or if you ever need additional resources. Um, before we get to questions, what I want to do very briefly is just say and talk a little bit about, you're fine to go to the next slide, I'm sorry. Um, you know, as I was putting this together, I thought, gosh, if we're, if we're right, if we're right to be concerned that there may be more online exploitation right now, as professionals, we want to make sure that we're aware of the resources that are out there to help these kids. Um, and so I just want to go through briefly in case you're not familiar with some of these resources that we have. This is a screenshot of our page, um, missingkids.org slash get help now. And you can see there's a, there's a tab to report, but there's also a tab to be linked to peer support who are 
adults whose children have been sexually exploited online, who are trained peer support people um, in a group to offer support to parents. Because a lot of times parents in a community, they may not know anyone else whose kids' sexual imagery has been circulated you know, widely and has been victimized in that way. That can be a hard thing to find in your own community. So we can connect them with parents who have also been through that. Um, and offer as well kind of specialized crisis support and, re and help them find local therapists who are really specialized in that as well. Um, and then there's in the middle, the removing content, which I'm gonna talk in more detail about in a second, but there's help for removing content once you know exploitive content is, is out online. And then that last button for locating attorneys, because especially for kids, when there's active circulation of an image, um, that can continue to happen for years and years and years. And there's a lot of legal stuff that's very specialized in terms of dealing with restitution, dealing with notifications. Um, and so finding attorneys who, are, who specialize in that, it can be really difficult. So that's another example of something you can refer clients in your um, jurisdiction back to NCMEC to find those really specialized resources and get some help around those issues. The next slide I do wanna talk about for a minute, um, this is our page and it says, is your explicit content out there? And you know, for a long time, what we would tell teenagers and, and kids is, you know, once you post it, it's out there forever. You'll never get it down. The internet is forever. And you know, that is something worthwhile talking to kids about that, you know, you really can never totally control content that you post or send someone. And there's always the possibility that we won't be able to get it down and be out there to forever. But we really want to add a nuance to that language and to tell kids that we can actually get content off the internet now better than we used to be able to. The technology is getting better to be able to do that. And so what we don't want to happen is we don't want a kid who has sent, say, sent an image to someone, that person ends up posting it or someone films something that they didn't know was being filmed and now it's on Instagram to just sit on it and just assume, well, there's nothing we can do. It's out there and it's going to circulate forever. Hope is lost. I can't do anything about it. There is something you can do about it. You can go to our web you see on the bottom there, there are different platforms. Click on that platform, step-by-step -step instructions for reporting and removing content from all of those different platforms. If those steps, if you don't want to go through those steps, if, if it's, you don't find the platform is being responsive, feel like the, the images is, is coming down quickly enough um, or that, like I said, they're not finding they will work with their contact platform and get it. Contact NCMEC, report it, we can get it down. And it's really important if we can really lessen the chance that it'll go into active circulation. So mm -hmm. we wanna make sure parents are aware of that resource. You guys hear me okay? I just gotta notice that my internet's not great. Am I still good? Um, Susan, I'm hearing a little bit of audio issues on my end, and I'm here. We're seeing in the chat some cutting in and out of audio. Okay. okay let me see. Is it any better? Let's see if we can hear you now, Susan. It's not any better. Um, let me make a suggestion while, while we wait a moment for Susan's video, for Susan's internet to come back to full strength. Bree, might you take this opportunity to launch our poll and we can get the feedback on our poll questions while we're waiting for Susan's internet to come back. Guys, guys can you take that upstairs? My internet's working. Take that upstairs. And Susan, you might want to mute while you're moving. So Bree, are you able to launch the poll now? I know it's a little earlier than we planned. Okay, sorry. Is the internet any better now? It does sound better, yes. Um, okay, perfect. Okay, then we will hold off when launching the poll uh, and take about okay. five more minutes on your presentation. Thank okay. you. Okay, yep, just a couple minutes. I'm almost done. Um, I did want to just show you this flyer that you can make available to kids um, and families in your area. Again, this is just services that we have that you can have ready for if this is something that affects your community, especially as things open back up and you're seeing clients and you come to find out that there's been online exploitation, um, you can be prepared with some really specialized resources. Um, the last slide that I have, I think, um, is just letting you all know, oh, the second to last slide, that one, um, with a picture of the girl. Um, yes. 
So we have some resources also for professionals that are more detailed about providing mental health services and other types of um, help for survivors of child sexual abuse imagery. And you see this captured in film document and I provided the links to come out afterwards to you all on this. Um, but these are insights from survivors and therapists who have helped kids whose imagery is online. And a lot of times, you know, as I said, these kids are dealing with the recirculation the recirculation and the re-traumatization into their adulthood. And so the, the therapeutic and clinical concerns of these um, survivors are a little different than um, other survivors of child sexual assault because of the added trauma of the distribution um, and circulation of their images. So this document is available on our website as well, um, um, as well as other publications and research and data about these issues. So I just wanna make sure again, if there's anyone who is not yet familiar with the National Center, we have a trove of resources um, in particular for helping professionals serving um, kids who have been victimized online. And I want to make sure that everyone's aware of those as well as our prevention resources. So I think that's all that I have. Um, and I'm happy to go to polls and live questions. Well, that was absolutely fabulous. Um, a ton of information crammed into a very short period of time. Yeah. Uh, let me check with my AppSAC folks. Do you have the poll ready to launch or should I go into the Q&A? So um, it looks like since there's a few of us logged in as AppSAC, um, we're having some poll challenges. If you want, I can ask the question and have folks uh, private message me their response so that we can still get poll responses. Would that work for you, Janet? Sure, thank you. Folks, if you're at your computer as opposed to a handheld device, um, we're gonna ask you a few questions and we would very much appreciate if you would type your answer as a go to the, ch the um, in the chat box, choose the name Bree Stormer and send your answers directly to Bree. That would be fabulous. Thank you, Bree. No problem. So the question that we asked is uh, on a scale from one to five, with five being the most useful and one being the least useful, how useful did you find this session? And that's the only one we've got this time. All right, I've got those coming in now um, and I'll go ahead and collect them after the session. Thanks so much. Wonderful. I will now move on to the questions. Okay, Susan. And folks, if the rest of you, with, uh, if you'd like to turn on your camera, if you're gonna participate in the Q&A, please feel welcome to turn on your camera. So that would be great. We could all see each other and where everybody's coming from. All right, so Susan, you're mm -hmm. still here, excellent. Mm -hmm. um, we have one question that came in uh, before the meeting, which is a good one. Can you talk a little bit about suggestions for safety during online gaming? Yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, again, it just, it all goes back to those communications and knowing your own kid, because the rules are gonna be different if you're talking about a five-year-old, if you're talking about a 16-year-old, you know, what kind of games you're talking about. Um, I mean, I think in general for young kids, we do, um, you know, recommend really limiting contact and, and conversation with people that they don't know. So turning off chat features where it's possible or giving them um, instructions about um, talking only about the game, things like that. Um, it just is really tricky. What we need to keep in mind is, is, again, just telling them never talk to someone you don't know on a game. If they know someone who's bullying them or harassing them, um, telling them not to ever talk to people they don't know isn't a very helpful instruction, right? So um, you're going to have to talk through with your kid and know your child's development and what they're doing online. And it's really going to depend on the platform and your child. So, um, you know, with that, we do have a tip sheet on gaming that provides some um, ideas of what to look for. I think the other thing I would say is just going back to that know the platform part. I think a lot of times we let kids play games and we don't know the capabilities. So if you don't know that a game has a chat feature um, and you've never talked to your child about that and that pops up, that's going to be more of a problem than if you've prepared your child for people may try and talk to you and here's how you close it out or here's how you report something that's concerning. Um, I know too when I talk to people in the industry, they say, you know, when you're setting up a console, there are ways you set it up if a child is using it and a lot of parents don't know that and they don't set up those protections. So there are settings you can use to, for example, disable chat from um, people and you may want to do that with a young kid, but you have to familiarize yourself with the game to even know that that's a possibility So I would say, you know, know what they're using know what it's capable of You know make decisions about what's safe given the age and and um, you know Capabilities and maturity of your child and talk with your child about that talk about why you're turning off chat If you're not turning off chat talk to them about why they need it 
and what to do if something inappropriate happens. I mean, if they're all talking about the game, cool. If someone tries to talk to them about something else and ask them where they live or says something threatening, obviously those are red flag behaviors they need to come and talk to you about. Um, so it really goes back to that conversation, but we do have some you know, points to get you started on our website as well, specific to gaming. Okay. Um, someone also asked, we specifically addressed the benefits and risks of using parental control apps. Yeah, I can. We, we don't endorse, you know, particular apps or services. Um, and so it's, it's not something where I could even go through what's in the industry and give you pros and cons of each of them. Um, it's kind of like I said before, I think those tools are really helpful. Um, but you just really have to look at, at what they do and what your kid can handle and, and what you want to prevent. So I, I can't really go through and tell you like this is the best one to download um, or use. Um, but I do know, you know, what I would recommend is looking at your internet service providers, the platforms that you use, they all have really good um, parental um, information for parental control. So look through that and read it. Um, you're just, unfortunately, you're, you're going to kind of have to go device by device and um, platform by platform. So I, I don't have, you know, the recommendation for the best one to download. Okay. Um, you spoke throughout your presentation on being familiar with your kids' platform. What are the most common platforms kids are using these days? I love that question. I don't have the answer to that question. Um, <laughs> I mean, it just, it is, you know, I, I definitely would, you know, one of the resources we often recommend is Common Sense Media, who I think do a very good job at being adept of really highlighting different platforms and putting up what kids are using right now and what the uh, most common ones are. The Pew Institute's another one who often puts up research about what kids are using. Um, but we literally don't spend time pulling that together because it just changes so much. Mm -hmm. And our feeling is too, I, I could tell you what the most common three ones are. It doesn't matter if those aren't the three your kids are on. So, I mean, it's important, but just go through their phones with them. I don't know what that one is. Show it to me. And if they're not going to show it to you, then, you know, maybe, you know, have an expectation that you have to know what's on their phone. And so they're going to have to show it to you. So um, I don't have that list. Um, you know, I can tell you, um, you know, kids are not on Facebook. You know, kids are on other things. Um, we're on Facebook. So, but no, I, I, I don't have the list. And honestly, I could show you a list and it'll be completely different tomorrow anyway. Um, but there are some good websites out there that do more of those kind of resources. Uh, yeah, let me underscore your endorsement of Common Sense Media. Mm -hmm. They do a very good job of putting out information for parents to keep them up mm -hmm. with what apps are, kids are most interested in. Mm -hmm. um, our next question, uh, what are the best sites for multilingual safety resources for English language learners? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, our stuff is all available in Spanish, at least. Um, and sometimes people have trouble finding it, but we, we have it set up with the toggle button at the top where you can toggle the whole website to Spanish. Um, I don't know. I, I, I'm i assuming Common Sense Media has stuff in other languages. I haven't looked at it recently. Um, I would say, too, we have some resources, um, even with symbol sticks, with anyone is um, familiar with those, and they are designed for kids with special needs. Um, and they use a lot of um, it, pictures to describe um, different safety concepts, and those may be helpful for kids who are learning English as well, um, depending on their ability and, and who you're talking about and, and where they are. Um, but I'm not, I'm not aware of other sites that have more languages, um, but I'd be interested if other people do. We're happy to look around a little bit and follow up. Okay. Um, this is going to be a broad question. How can we prevent the spread of child sex abuse materials online beyond identifying the existing materials, victims, and perpetrators? Yeah, very broad question. And I would, you know, definitely invite any of you to watch some of my Exploited Children Division um, colleagues um, at NCMEC Present because it is, you know, the technology and the um, breadth of what they do is, is quite amazing um, that we're not going to be able to get into today. Um, I would say a couple of things, though, you know, there is more being done on the tech side in terms of identifying existing images, and there's things like hash values and photo DNA that can help platforms and help law enforcement identify images we know um, depict child sex abuse imagery, and the more platforms are being able to automate finding that and taking it down more quickly is really a victory for, um, you know, the kids who are victimized by that imagery. Um, you know, I just think, so there's a technology half and there's the Internet Crimes Against Children Task Force who are working very hard to, you know, find these kids, find these perpetrators, hold them accountable, all the things that they do. And all of that is really important. I think the other thing to underscore for this group, though, is kind of what I said before, which is 
what we're talking about is child sexual abuse that is being documented and distributed. So the way we're going to get upstream of this is not only focusing on the technology, but focusing on stopping those acts from happening in the first place. So if kids are not being sexually abused, there's nothing to take a picture of and distribute online. So I, you know, I think those efforts of the tech companies and the things we're doing around CCM are really, really, really important. I think for this group to congratulate you all on what you do and thinking about your work in your local communities, you know, the more we promote protective factors and think about ways that we're strengthening families where there's not child sex abuse occurring in the first place is really how we're going to get child sexual abuse off the internet. Okay, um, what steps can be taken to ensure that we have the capacity to address this rapid increase in proliferation of child sex abuse materials online? And what I'm going to add to that, would you just re repeat to the folks on this Zoom chat the number of complaints that Nick Mick has investigated? Because the number kind of blows me away when I hear it. I don't have that in front of me right now. I think it was over, was it over six, well, it was 40,000 images, right? And 16,000 reports? Yeah, 40 mm -hmm. million reports mm -hmm. since, the, since the cyber tip line opened. Mm -hmm. I mean, think 40 million mm -hmm. reports. Yeah, just... um, I think it was 16, 16 or 18 million last year. I apologize, I don't have it in front of me. It is on our website. Okay. It's a lot. Yeah. Um, it's a lot of imagery um, that we're looking at. Um, and as I said, I think if you're interested in this, you know, um, look on our website and contact us about a presentation by some of our analysts on the cyber tip line and on the child victim identification program, which I didn't even talk about, which um, helps identify kids who are in imagery. And we have um, tens of thousands of kids who we don't even know who they are right now. And, and part of the job of collecting those images and looking at them is trying to match up kids we've already identified and kids who are yet unidentified. Um, and there are people that is their full-time job and they do that day in day out and support law enforcement in their investigations of those cases. Um, I know that this is way above my pay grade and not my area of expertise, but if you're interested, I know there is some legislation in Congress right now that we've been working very closely with some legislators on um, in terms of increasing resources for um, investigation of these crimes, including money for, um, you know, some of the services that Nick Mick does to get more staff working on those cases on our end, but also the ICACs and also the FBI. And I know those things are being looked at and I'm happy to provide more information on that and follow up. Okay, so in the last minute or two before the hour ends, uh, I wanna throw a message, a, a question out to the group. If anybody wants to unmute their mic and, and respond to this, uh, one of the most devastating aspects for a kid after their images of them being sexually abused is circulated online is um, the shame and humiliation they are subjected to from peers and folks in the community. What are some thoughts we have about how we might change the social norms so that these kids that are victimized in the first place aren't ex victimized a second time by being shamed and humiliated? Anybody want to jump in on that philosophically? Yes, I think uh, Caitlin, uh, just unmute yourself and or or Ilana, if you could unmute folks. I think. Um, hi, this is Charlene Baker. Okay. Okay. I don't know. Can you hear me or no? Mm -hmm. Yes, we can. Okay. Yeah. Um, I think by letting them know, letting kids know and feel comfortable with talking about it and um, expressing that they, you know, have no fear, you know, if somebody's threatening them or anything like that, not to say anything, to make sure that they no, feel okay. that they can you say something. Okay. How many days will that be? Okay. Uh, was somebody else coming in with a comment? Yeah, this is Steve it, Henderson know. from NASW in D.C. In oh, my right. elementary school, one of the problems, we actually had a case where FBI did come to the school. They did talk with some of the kids. We had a peer mediation team. And so the class that that student was in, we addressed it. And anytime any other issues came up, we brought all of the uh, participants, the ones picking and not picking, into a peer mediation session. And it soon just kind of vanished. So peer mediation was an, a useful tool. Yes. Thank you. Um, Ms. Bentley, I see you were trying to jump in. If we can unmute Caitlin Bentley. If... Oh. Here we are. We can hear you now. All right, great. Um... I kind of think that it might be important to sort of shift the way that we think about how the image is distributed because 
I think a lot of times we assume it's going directly to some sort of online forum, but usually this is, these are things that are being shared among kids, like on, um, I'm so sorry, <laughs> that are on folks' um, cell phones or saved in an image gallery of some sort, and maybe normalizing the conversation about when um, someone receives that, that it's okay to, um, it's okay to talk about receiving it and to talk about what your next steps are, mm -hmm. as opposed to immediately kind of saying, oh, this is about only the survivor. It's also about the person who is choosing to um, kind of help and assistance after receiving the material itself. Good point. Receiving something that you didn't ask for is also very upsetting. Yes, yes. We are up against the clock at exactly two o'clock. Uh, I want to thank all of you, the well over 300 folks that joined us today, urge you to join us again next week for an excellent discussion on what we can do to assess and keep kids safe when we're working with families remotely. Um, remind you that if you'd like to join APSAC, please do so and use the discount code ZoomChat10 and save some money to, to join us. Also, I want to be clear, the chat box is filling up with resources that you guys are sharing with each other. Um, we will grab as many as we can and include them in what you see, uh, but when this video goes up, hopefully um, we'll be, you'll be able to see the Zoom chat in the sidebar and pick up these other uh, references. But thank you for everybody who joined us. And Susan, thank you for the work that you do. Thank you to the folks at the National Center for giving you to us for this time, for the time you spent preparing. And thanks to all of you who joined us, answered our poll. And please, any feedback you have for us, just drop us a note at info at appsac.org. Uh, we'd love to know other topics you might want to hear, anything else we can do to support you as um, all of our practices change during this very difficult time. So thank you all again, and we hope we see you on subsequent chats. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you very you. much, everyone. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. Bye.